Propaganda is very strong. Um, I like to point out the poll that I saw a few months back where they said that the average Republican voter trusts corporate media less than 30 percent, average independent voter trusts corporate media just over 30 percent, and the average Democratic voter trusts corporate media just under 80 percent. And when the numbers are so un- egregiously bad, uh, when, it, when there's that big of a gap, um, that's when I think you can see just how effective propaganda is, because even on social media, when you present this to them and say, this is what's happening, they look at it and say, yeah, it sucks, but the GOP's worse, so it's OK with me. And I think the fact that there is sort of this consensus of, yeah, it's too bad that this is happening, but I'll accept it because my side is going to benefit as a result. We saw this happen to the Green Party candidate in 2020 in Wisconsin. I'm wondering what your guys' experiences has been reaching the electorate in regards to whether they see this as a real impediment to progress and they're willing to say, yeah, this is not good and we have to do something about it. You know, when we were out petitioning and um, and we got more than 22 and a half thousand signatures and, and, and we talked to tens of thousands of people and we were at festivals and concerts and all kinds of places to get these signatures. So we did not run into that argument uh, very often, like the MSNBC argument. We just didn't because because we were talking to people who were nor- normal people. I mean, I, I find that that argument about the spoiler it yeah. is something that exists online in social media spaces or MSNBC, which is fine for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party for a degree, because that's who really is their donor base. That's who turns out to make sure the primaries go the way it goes, you know, that kind of thing. But the reality is, is that most people uh, were not concerned about that. And they were very enthusiastic for another option for something that would uh, be available to them that would represent their interests or in, in some way rectify the situation we're in. Uh, I mean, people are really suffering. We just had the, the latest uh, rental uh, numbers come out here. And North Carolina, uh, year on year uh, across the state, 30 percent increase in rents. And in parts of North Carolina, it's 50 percent. Where, where I live, it's, it's, it's been a 50 percent increase year on year for rent. And that's what people are concerned about. And they know that the same people that have been in power are going to do nothing about that. And they also know it's just not one issue. They know it's not just about rent. It's about because they're feeling it. So they're also getting pressured on health care and they're getting pressured on their wages and they're getting pressured, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have not really encountered you know, and I, I may have said this before, we were out, partic- we were petitioning at our early primary voting places because our, our time petitioning overlapped with our primary voting. And so even in the most partisan spaces, like I didn't want to go to that because I was like, oh, my God, I'm just going to run into these, get into arguments with people. And it's just going to be. And no, I don't think the five times I petitioned at a primary voting place, I don't think I ran into anybody who came up with the, you're going to ruin it for us and the GOP is going to win and we're all going to be under a fascist tyranny because of you. Like I didn't come, I mean, people who had literally three or four minutes before been casting a ballot for a Democratic or Republican primary uh, ballot were in the parking lot talking to us and signing our petition to recognize the Green Party as a part, because even in the most partisan spaces, there was this acknowledgement that, yes, the system is, is, is corrupt, it's undemocratic, and it's hurting us, and we need to do something. And, and that was, that's been our experience, it's enthusiasm for, uh, you know, more options, uh, to put it as simply as possible. Good. And let and let us not forget that ranked choice voting would help all of this very much as well. I mean, when I when I'm sitting here and listening to having so many choices, it's so much better sounding when I think we could have ranked choice voting. Um, And I and I wanted I wanted to ask you both what what is the remedy you seek? So you, you both have like pending litigation, like what what is going on? Like, what is your recourse? What is your ideal recourse at this point going forward? Yeah. So uh, for us, and, and I'll, I'll even put some context because what we're asking for is is not a small thing. It's pretty big, but I want to lay the foundation that it has precedent. So in 2003, the, the federal courts ordered Connecticut to rewrite their ballot access laws because they were unconstitutional. 
because they were fr- restricted uh, free speech so much uh, that that they were had to rewrite their laws. Uh, they eased them a little bit, but the outcome has been the same. Still no primaries against sitting U.S. House members. Uh, and so this is the first uh, significant challenge that's happening to these laws. So we're challenging the constitutionality of these laws. We're, uh, we're talking about it specifically in COVID, uh, saying that uh, given the fact that there's still an ongoing pandemic uh, and they required us to do everything that we normally would have to do that nobody has been able to overcome, uh, and then layer on top of that, a pandemic that's killed a million Americans, that that's just insurmountable. Uh, so uh, we're, we're asking for us to be placed on the ballot because these laws are unconstitutional, especially during COVID. And I'll add that four of our staffers got a COVID petitioning in the last uh, 15 days, uh, one of them being a senior. And so uh, it, it's 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 not only uh, uh, you know bad for ballot access, it's literally could have killed one of our volunteers uh, because he was at high risk. Uh, and so uh, hopefully the judge will look at that and say, yeah, this, this is, uh, you know, this can't be uh, the level of of uh, kind of uh, effort needed just to get on the ballot. This is unconstitutional. So we be, we get placed immediately on the ballot. The biggest thing that could happen, which is possible, is that they're forced to rewrite their laws again. That they're found to be unconstitutional uh, even outside of COVID. Uh, and so uh, that is a possibility. Um, but what we're asking for is just for the judge to at least rule that they're unconstitutional during COVID, uh, because we believe that that's just you know a clear case uh, of a, a violation of our freedom of speech. So you can still like you still want to get on the ballot. When is the yeah. when is the election? So uh, the election was planned for August 9th. The judge has ruled uh, or has decided if we win this uh, case and if my rights and the, the voters' rights were violated, that our primary would be pushed back to August 30th, uh, and we'll have essentially a special election where only myself and the incumbent will be placed on that ballot. Uh, and uh, and so that that's the remedy we're seeking, and we expect this to go to the state supreme court one way or another. Uh, if we win, we imagine that they won't let us win that is easily and they'll probably challenge uh, to the state Supreme Court. Yeah, I would think so. And Matthew, what are you I mean, what are you hoping like where are you guys hoping to get in terms of like remedy? Yeah, so we're in federal court. Uh, we go before the judge on August 8th, actually. Uh, we're in that whole process. We submitted our first motion and then we're waiting for the state and we're we're we are. Um, we are, uh, uh, our suit is against the state uh, board of elections. However, the Democratic Party has filed a motion to intervene. Uh, they want to be co-defendants. And they've also made it very clear, and this is the Democratic Party, the DSCC, not the local Democratic Party. Right. They've also made it very clear that um, they will do everything possible to keep us off the ballot. I mean, they, they, they said, they more or less said that in their motion to intervene, that while our interests align with the state's, Ours go much further. And they, so even if they are certified, we will further challenge. I mean, they, they, they've, they're showing all their hands here, just as the state itself is showing its hand by continually referencing the August 15th deadline for ballot printing. So that's the that's the, the, the I think their final layer of defense is that ballot printing, where if they can delay us, if they can extend this, if they can just throw so much down that it just takes so long to get through it all. And then we get to the point where ballots have to be printed because absentee ballots need to go out. That will be their way to keep us off. So we're seeking uh, the court, we're asking the court to immediately certify us because it's now getting close to almost 60 days since we filed our petitions with the state for certification. We surpassed our threshold by more than 2,100 ballot signatures. We have never received a legal justification from the state as to why we were not provided with certification, as well as we've not received any evidence to um, support their allegations of fraud, wrongdoing, irregularities, all the things they keep saying that, uh, you know, some compliant press here is lapping up and redistributing, um, you know, as well as there is no due evidence. We were never given, let alone seen the evidence, we were never given a, an opportunity to defend ourselves. And then again, no legal justification for what they did. So this is what we're saying to the court. And, you know, so it's our first and 14th constitutional amendments as well as due process. We're asking to be certified and our nominees to be placed on the ballot. What I would like to see happen is uh, I would like to see eventually a process become underway that takes the power of the elections board out of the controlling political party and puts it into some nonpartisan uh, authority. I mean, we all know how that usually works and how uh, things evolve and those get overtaken as well. But at least to have the statement put forward that this was a corrupt overreach by the controlling political power to keep themselves in power. I think if we can get that acknowledgement and then we can move forward in a way that at least attempts some type of reform to get this out of the hand of the uh, political party in power, 
that will go a long way to helping us take, yeah, and I, want to, I don't want to say take back or rebuild because it's not like we ever had a good system anyway. You know, I mean, particularly, I mean, guys that look like me did for a long while, but most people in this country, it's not been good for. So, you know, I want to be careful with my language in the sense that we do have to take control of it. We do have to build it. We have to imagine it in a way that we want it to be so it serves our interests. And I hopefully this lawsuit can have the effect that it does a little bit to move us towards that goal. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.